Hello. Well, it's good to see so many of you back. Uh, um, as we said, my name is Scott Davis. I run a company, thirstyhead.com, that focuses on Groovy and Grails training. I hope to see many of you here tomorrow for my Groovy talks and on Friday as well for my Grails workshop. But uh, I'm here today to talk about HTML. Uh, I spoke about HTML5 this morning. And, uh, oh, by the way, um, I, I haven't been able to read all of the tweets yet. I, I don't have uh, uh, internet access here. But apparently some of the people are saying I was too hard on Microsoft this morning. Uh, uh, let, me, let me be very clear. Since uh, over the, the, the lunchtime keynote, Microsoft officially apologized for IE6. Allow me to apologize for Microsoft and give them credit where credit is due. <laughs> Make no mistake that IE9 is an incredible accomplishment for Microsoft. It is a wonderful browser that is moving towards standards uh, compatibility. IE10 looks to be even better. I'm not a Windows developer. I don't spend time in that browser. But any time a company spends time and effort to become more standards compliant and work towards a common goal, and quite frankly, the common good for web developers, we do need to applaud that effort. So does that clear the air now? I'm not a Microsoft hater. OK. OK, very good. Thankfully, we are not going to talk about anything here that is Microsoft specific or otherwise. We're here to talk about web services. Now take a moment, form an answer in your mind. When I say web services, what is the first technology that leaps to mind? Soap. Absolutely. I heard you say it already. Soap, right? Why would that come to mind, huh? Now I get to make fun of soap. It's a brilliant technology, but it's last century's technology, right? Way back in the 20th century, in soap's defense, it was one of the first implementations of web services. Not the first. Did any of you spend any time in XML RPC? Yeah, absolutely. It certainly wasn't the last form of web services either, but certainly it was one of the most popular, and it was the first one to really gain our attention. This talk is not about SOAP, but it is every bit as much about web services as SOAP, or XML RPC, or Atom, or RSS, or JSON, or any of these others are. But all those examples I gave you were services, separate from the web. We use them together, web services together. But these are technologies that are separate from your browser-based technologies. So what I'm going to talk about today is truly web services brought together as one. The technologies I'm going to talk about are not separate endpoints, not separate technologies that need a separate technology stack. To consume. I'm talking about web services that are fully integrated with the web. And I think when you see a bit about what's going on here, you'll get excited about it because it really is truly what we should be thinking of when we think of web services. So there are two technologies specifically I'll be talking about. One of them is RDFA. It's a more traditional semantic web bit of technologies. But we'll also get a chance to talk about microformats. Microformats are very different in that they're a grassroots uh, development. They're a way for us to apply these semantics to our web pages, not waiting for any formal standard to evolve or any organization to tell us we can do this. With microformats, the grassroots have come in and said, we'll continue to reuse existing elements in new and exciting ways to add semantics to your web pages. Wonderful resource, isn't it? I use it all the time. So this is the Wikipedia definition of what RDFA is. And the most important thing is not the research, excuse me, the resource description framework. It's the A. RDF in attributes. Because what we'll find is RDFA is a series of HTML tags, HTML tags that you're continuing to use to build your web pages. But you're going to use attributes to add additional semantic detail to what you're doing. You're going to use attributes to add the metadata to this information. 
Now, RDFA is going through a very formal process. It's going through the W3C. The W3C, in many ways, is allowing you to reuse existing attributes. But many times, as well, they're introducing new attributes to the language that allow you to express this metadata. Now, as I said, microformats are a very grassroots organization. There's no way that we can begin inventing our own attributes. And so what the microformats for, uh, movement is allowing us to do is to use already existing attributes in new and different ways. And at the end of the day, it's not what, that you should choose one over the other. At the end of the day, you should be familiar with all of these and how they're being used on the web right now. And you can choose the bits and pieces that are most applicable to what you're doing. But the most important thing for you to realize, much like my HTML5 talk this morning, I'm not here telling you about some theoretical future technology that will be coming down the pike sometime. I'm a real practitioner. I am interested in technology that is right here, right now, that I can use. And that's what I'm sharing with you. All the examples we're going to see today are not theoretical examples. These are examples that are already in use in the wild. And in many cases, you might not even realize it. That's why the web services are hidden, eh? the name of the talk. They're already integrated into your web experience without you knowing that it's there. So before we're able to talk about RDFA, and before we're able to talk about microformats, I want to spend just a little time talking to you about metadata. Yes, because metadata is what we're really here to talk about. Adding this additional information to our web pages. This may sound like a silly question. What is this? An LP record? Okay, all the people who answered, you're very old, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Lean over to the young person next to you and explain that this is how your grandmother and grandfather used to listen to music, you know, myself included. When I was moving in with my wife when we were getting married, I had a very young niece. She picked up a heavy box and said, what is this? And I said, don't drop that. That's my music. She said, oh, that doesn't play music, Scott. She had grown up in an era where all she knew were CDs. She said, how could this big black thing play music? I said, ah, oh, after I explain records to you, I'll explain eight-track tapes to you next. You've missed a whole series of musical formats. But LP records are a great example of what we're talking about. The music that comes out of this record is the data. Think of this metaphorically as the web page that you're viewing in your browser. And if we think about what the metadata is on this LP record, we find that it's licked and sticked on. The metadata is almost an afterthought, isn't it? Because this is an analog format, there's no way that the sound could convey through some alternate secondary channel who the artist was or what album this came from or the length of the song, right? So in this case, metadata was almost an afterthought, added long after the fact and separated from the data. Now I talked about CDs. The very youngest people growing up today are going to look at my vast CD collection and say, great grandpa, what is all that? <laughs> all they know are MP3s, aren't they? And what's especially interesting about the MP3 revolution is what Steve Jobs said when he created the iTunes store. Because if you'll remember, Napster was all the rage, wasn't it? Napster was a way where you could get MP3s for free. You could steal them or you could download them for free depending on which side of the argument you were with. And Steve Jobs said, yeah, all that free stuff out there, I'm going to start charging people 99 cents a song for that. And people said, are you crazy? Are you insane? People thought that the value proposition of Napster was free. And Steve says, I will bet you that for 99 cents, someone would be willing to pay not only for a nice, clean recording, but a recording that had all the metadata associated with it, where I could go in and see the album and the artist and the album art and the lyrics and the genre. And if you think about what iTunes did, it wasn't so much that there weren't MP3 players before iTunes. It was that never has there been an application that gathered all your music together so well. 
If you start doing smart playlists, you can say, I'm interested in folk music, and it'll go through and start playing all those songs that have that metadata associated with it. iTunes absolutely transformed the way we listen to music. MP3s downloads, not just from Apple, but certainly from Amazon and all the other providers, now outsell all other form of information. And when we look at iTunes, we have to realize they were up against free. And why did they win that battle? Metadata. The metadata is not to be underestimated. The power of metadata comes in over and over again. When we look at television programming in the US, it's been changed fundamentally by the idea of TiVo. TiVo was the early player in the market, the first one to introduce this. Now almost every cable television provider, every satellite TV provider, whether it's Sky TV in the, in the UK or if it's uh, Direct TV or Dish Network or any of these, we find that this is yet another revolution for metadata. I can remember a time when I would reach out to a physical knob on a TV and turn, and you would never have any idea what show you were watching. You had no idea what show was coming up next. You had no idea what shows were available on the other channels at the same time. Certainly that was an analog medium. The move to digital TV, and when you, uh, talk, when you read interviews from the, the, the founder of TiVo, Everyone said, oh, well, we get TiVo, right? It's just like a, a digital VCR. You don't need the tapes anymore. It just records to disk. That's the revolution. He says, no, 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 no. That's an implementation detail. He says the real revolution that TiVo offered was metadata. For the first time in TV programming, I could go in and say, please record Seinfeld. I don't care what channel it's on. I don't care what time it's on. Just record Seinfeld or The Sopranos, or 30 Rock, or Myth TV, or, or The Daily Show, or any of these shows. All of a sudden, your TiVo was able to suggest other shows. If you like The Daily Show, perhaps you would like The Colbert Report as well. We could even go in and say, just record first runs of these shows. Ignore all the reruns. Think about that. Think about how rich that television viewing experience is. And we could say, oh, we've had TV for years. But this is significantly different, isn't it? The TiVo revolution was all about metadata. Who's this guy? Do any of you recognize him? I heard that. Yes, yeah, say again louder. Tim Berners-Lee, Berners very good. You get an A. A plus, a gold star. Yes, absolutely. Tim Berners-Lee. Now, Tim Berners-Lee is, is the father of the internet, is the father of the web. He's the gentleman who created the World Wide Web. Back in the late 80s, he implemented the HTTP protocol. He implemented the HTML markup language. He was the one behind all of this. If you think about who he was, he was a scientist. Why did he invent the web? Well, he wanted to publish his scholarly papers. And he didn't want to publish it in a format that was proprietary. He didn't want to publish his papers in WordPerfect 5.1 for DOS, or WordStar, or MePro, or any of those other word processors, right, that are no longer with us anymore. Let's put our hands over our hearts, right? Yeah. <laughs> Throw them on the funeral pyre. I don't miss them at all. He didn't want to have his information tied up in a proprietary format. He wanted to have an open way, a searchable way to do these things. And if you think about scientific papers, one of the most important things about scientific papers is being able to cite your sources. Being able to say, Dr. Smith hypothesized that this would happen. When I did the experiments, I found different results, and Dr. Jones corroborates my results. This idea of hyperlinking that information, this document links to this document, links to this document, was crucial to the early success of the web. Now what's interesting is we think of the web as documents, as human readable documents. And that certainly is, we're the humans, right? We're at the top of the food chain. Yes, we should be first and foremost in being able to consume this data. But from a very early stage, he says it's not enough that we just have human-readable documents. We need machine 
readable documents as well. We need to make sure that the computers are able to consume this information just as well. That the, con the machine is able to create new links to data that we wouldn't have thought of before. Remember the TiVo example. I want to record The Daily Show. Would you also like to see Stephen Colbert? That's the machine suggesting it to me. And it's only available through metadata. When I create my smart playlist in iTunes and I'm listening to blues, the smart playlist is fundamentally predicated on the fact that a machine can read that metadata and make additional suggestions. This was Tim Berners-Lee vision. As a matter of fact, again, if we go to Wikipedia, one of my favorite resources, Tim Berners-Lee said, I have a dream. I have a dream. No, that was Martin Luther King Jr. That, was, that wasn't what he said. No, he said, I have a dream of a time when computers have the same capabilities of traversing these links. Computers have the same capabilities to make these links between the data that humans are. If you've never had a chance to see Dr. Berners-Lee speak, I highly recommend you go out to the TED website. Are you familiar with the TED website? Look for his presentation out there. He's an incredibly dynamic speaker. And I kid you not, he had an audience many times the side of this, all chanting together, linked data now, linked data now. They were getting that excited about semantic web and linked data, about metadata. Hard to believe that'd be exciting, metadata. Yeah, very good speaker. Now, Tim Berners-Lee made the mistake early on, though, of defining a whole separate set. And that's how I started this talk. When we talk about web services, and you think of them separately, we think of SOAP over here and web developers over here, right? What we're finding now through REST, representational state transfer, is this data is coming closer and closer together, isn't it? And while these technologies are incredibly powerful and you can do sophisticated things, the fundamental requirement is you have to represent your data twice. Once in HTML and once in RDF. And if you have to represent the data twice, who's going to lose? The humans or the computers? The computers every time. And that's why the web has become so fundamentally document-centric as opposed to data centric. But what we find is even at the very beginning there were the germs of these thoughts, the seeds that were planted early on. When we were dealing with web pages, we had the ability to create meta tags, didn't we? Do you use these meta tags? You should be. Absolutely. This is the first thing that's been supported since the very beginning, being able to provide keywords and descriptions and the author. You can see what we're doing now. We're beginning to provide data about data on your web pages. Is this information ever displayed anywhere? No, absolutely not. It's hidden in your header, but it gets used in surprising ways. If you go to my website, thirstyhead.com, you'll see a lot of text on that page. But there's one bit of text you will never see. That text is the text you see when you Google Thirsty Head. When I Google Thirsty Head, it comes up with this information. Thirsty Head offers grooving grails training taught by industry experts, blah, 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 blah. There's never anywhere on the visible part of the page. You will never find it unless you do a view source. Do you do view sources? Oh, I love doing view sources. Absolutely. As web developers, that's what we should be doing. I love seeing what JavaScript libraries they're using. I like seeing how clean their code is. If it's nicely indented, you say, oh, this is a good web shot. If it's hack and slap and all over the place, what a terrible website. Yeah. But if you do a view source on thirstyhead.com, you'll see metadata. You'll see the meta description in there. Thirsty Head offers Groovy and Grails training taught by industry experts. Google is paying attention to this information. Now, unfortunately, this information gets misused as well, doesn't it? I still provide keywords in there because this is information about my website. I provide groovy and grails training and groovy recipes and mastering grails and practically groovy. I'm trying to supply more information about my website. But because these meta tags were abused in the early days when people were trying to game the search engines, right? Not that I've gone to any um, 
porn sites before. But if you would go to porn sites, you would find they had sex, 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 thousands of times in the keyword. Because if they figured if one person wrote sex 10 times and one person wrote sex 100 times, well, then 200 must be better and 400 must be better than that. 1,000 must be the best at all, right? They were trying to game the system to come up to the top of the search results. Like I said, I've never been there myself, but I read about those things. <laughs> So the keywords aren't as important as they ought to be. But the descriptions and the authors are. And the rest of the things I'm going to show you today are absolutely legitimate ways to increase your SEO, your search engine optimization. Because it's not gaming the system. It's providing legitimate metadata for your websites. For instance, if I go to Google and I type in coffee, I'm going to get the hits that I would expect to get. I'm going to get a Wikipedia article. I'm going to see Starbucks, of course. You have Starbucks, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we get all these kinds of hits. Now, I know that I'm not in a coffee-drinking country. Oh, I had Chennai tea over the weekend. Oh, so good. So good. So if I'm interested in tea, I'm going to go to Google, and I'm going to type in tea. And what do I get? Darn it. The Texas Education Agency? <laughs> that tastes terrible. That's not what I'm interested in at all. And if we look at even the top four hits, I see the Wikipedia article, I see a premium tea company, and then I see tea children's clothing. <laughs> right? This is a failure, isn't it? And not on Google's part. I'm not here to poke them in the eye. This is a failure of metadata. Google was forced to use simple string matching. And what we find is simple string matching doesn't provide us the depth of semantics we need to really get the information we're looking for. So while I'm here talking about micro formats and RDFA, really what this is about at the end of the day is search engine optimization. Because I want machines out there, the Google search spiders, to be able to traverse my website and pull out the information about information so that they can increase my page rank, so they can sort me up higher in the list. So we're going to see many, many examples of search engines because it's a great example of machine reading the data as opposed to existing attributes. That's what the A stands for. In other cases, they're creating new attributes. If you're interested in more, Info on RDFA, you can go to rdfa.info. That works out nicely, doesn't it? rdfa.info has plenty of examples of websites. I was just looking at it earlier today. Again, I don't have a web connection here. But um, you begin finding um, stories and case studies. Flickr is using RDFA now. Facebook is using RDFA. If you go to rdfa.info on the, on, the, on the main page, you'll start seeing these big, big names. You shouldn't be surprised at all. But these folks are all using RDFA. If you want a good introduction to RDFA, I don't know if you're familiar with A List Apart. That's the website, A List Apart, all one word, alistapart.com. It's a wonderful resource for web developers. That talks about HTML and CSS and JavaScript and techniques. It's been around for a number of years. But they have a very nice introduction to RDFA out there as well. And they say basically this. They say when we're looking at our search results, the top example is from Google, the bottom example is from Yahoo, all the major search engines are paying attention. Have you noticed how in these uh, 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 new results, if you search for a restaurant like the Drooling Dog Barbecue Restaurant in California, it's going to bring up star ratings from Yelp. Now think about this. The Drooling Dog has their own website. But Yelp, which is a, a rating website that allows people to go and say, oh, I had a wonderful meal here, please come back, or I had a terrible meal, never visit them again. But Yelp is a completely separate organization that allows you to rate these things. And Google mashes that up right in the search results. If there's a restaurant that has Yelp ratings, it'll mix them together. Now, if you click on the link, it'll take you to the drooling dog. But that additional information, that metadata, is data being pulled from Yelp.com. You can go into the front door, go to Yelp.com, type in Drooling Dog, read the human readable portions of that format. But Yelp is an early adopter and a very important adopter of RDFA, being able to provide their ratings and things like that. So Google is able to go out and mix that information together. 
If you search for movies, oftentimes you'll see the rating of the movie. This is rated PG, this is rated G. The, the uh, director of that movie, the actors that were in the movie, the genre, the movie theater, the start times, ticket prices, all that stuff is metadata, isn't it? And so while one link might take you to the movie theater itself, that metadata might be mixed in from entirely different sources. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. So these are the things we see all the time and don't even realize that we're using it. Best Buy is a great case study for the success. They started using a particular RDFA uh, uh, ontology called Good Relations. We'll talk about this, but Good Relations is a specific dialect, a specific um, ontology of RDFA that allows you to express metadata about your stores. What are the types of merchandise your store sells? What are your store hours? Where are you located? These kinds of things. And when Best Buy started applying RDFA and good relations to all their web pages, the end user didn't see any different. The end user continued to read the HTML as they normally did. But what they found is that in Google, they had a 30% increase in traffic to the Best Buy website. They found that through Yahoo, they had a 15% increase in click-throughs. This is search engine optimization, isn't it? This is exactly what you want as an organization. And they were able to track this stuff directly to the good relations they were adding to their website. So what does this mean? Well, this means this is what we're looking at. This is a particular store, and it's got the address and the store hours in a very human-readable format. And then when you go and do a view source on this, you begin finding an additional set of metadata. We go in and we see, all right, store hours. That's certainly what we can see. This H3 right here, store hours, is represented right here. We have a class for hours. But notice this rel. The rel tag will come up again. What is the relationship of that div, or what is that relative to? And we can see GR is good relations. This is has opening hours specification. So this is a standard. So as websites go in and begin looking for that attribute, they say, aha, now I know that the store has provided when it's open and when it's closed. And as you go looking at the rest of these attributes, we can see that here is the opening hours for the day of the week. And here's Monday, even shortened to that M-O-N. That's human readable, but there's no semantics to that. But when we go in and see the resource that it's associated with, Monday, this is the canonical reference to Monday. So it doesn't matter what you provide down here, M, M-O-N, M-O-N-D-A-Y, all caps, lowercase, Hindi, Tamil Nadu, right? Uh, any of these kinds of letters, it doesn't matter. When you provide the metadata, the canonical representation of Monday, then we know that these machines can read it and process it appropriately. It's especially interesting when we start looking at when it opens and closes, 10 and 9. Now humans, we read that, we understand it instantly, don't we? 10 a.m., 9 p.m., right? There's no way that a store could open after it's already closed, right? Those are the semantics that humans are great at and machines are terrible at. They are dumb little robots running around, so we have to give them additional hints. All right, here's the deal. The first one is when it opens. The second one is when it closes. Oh, I understand now. Thank you. Yes. And they're able to do appropriate things with this. Does that make sense? Yeah. And think about if Best Buy had provided a SOAP interface, saying, oh, you want to know when this store is open? It's easy. You just create the SOAP package with a header and an envelope and a body, and you make an HTTP post request, and then you parse the results, and see how easy that is? No. What they've done is they've integrated the two. This is every bit the form of web services. The point of web services for machine-readable data. But SOAP is certainly machine-readable, as is... The only difference is Google doesn't have to make two calls to two separate endpoints. It makes the same call and parses out the bits that it's most interested in, just like we parse out the bits that we're most interested in. It's a good relationship. Good relationship. This is just one example of the types of things you can do to your things. 
This is an open source standard. You can go in, you can begin applying it to your stores right now. As a matter of fact, if you look at Good Relations, they have nice uh, presentations on how to do this. They even have a generator themselves where you're able to fill in an HTML form and click on Submit, and they'll say, here are the types of tags you should be applying to your website. So it's very easy for you to do, and you see the more people who are using these tags, the more benefit. If you're trying to get ahead of your competitor, what you need to do is be rushing towards this. Right? Making sure that Google knows more about your company than the competitor. But good relations is just one example. As I said, there are many, many different, I almost said thousands, I bet you thousands, certainly tens, if not hundreds of different dialects out there. And there are a couple of really nice Firefox plugins. One of them is Semantic Radar. Another one of them is Operator. But in each case, what these are, these are plugins into Firefox. And as you visit a website, you'll see different areas of your web page light up, showing you, hey, there's information here. I know it's very small to see on this page. I apologize. But this is that same Best Buy page. And the very first link is Contacts. And if you click on that drop-down list, it provides you the ability to import this into your address book. And so it makes it very easy to do this. You'll see that locations is highlighted over there. If you click on that drop-down list, it says, would you like to plot this on a Google map? And it provides you that kind of information. So we're relying on external browser Chrome to provide that kind of functionality. But this is another way we begin seeing the real value proposition of what it's able to do. So there are things like uh, bookmarks. You can add it to your bookmarks and resources and events. If this were something that had a temporal aspect to it through RDFA, you could begin adding it to your calendar. Yeah? Excellent. Excellent. So O'Reilly, it's not surprising since they publish technical books, that they've always been on the kind of technological forefront of their websites as well. If you go to O'Reilly and you look for any books in there, I mentioned uh, uh, dive into HTML5 earlier today, or HTML5 up and running, um, the Groovy Recipes or Programming Groovy or any one of these books, when you type in the search and you pull up the results, this is very nice HTML presented to the end user. But if we do a view source, we begin seeing the metadata come out in the head of this. Notice what they say here, link rel equals canonical. Once again, they're saying, we feel that we are the canonical source for information about groovy recipes. Well, oh, they're the publisher. Yeah? And as we go on, they say, all right, here's the title, and here's the subtitle, and the author, and the publisher, and graphics, large, medium, and small. Those graphics aren't even displayed on the page. But they're providing that information to you, so as you're trying to do this, you can programmatically pull that out and show a thumbnail or show a full screen image or anything in between. And as we go looking, not at the header information, but the body of the text, they've marked up this text in a way that we can see that here's the Dublin Core creator. And here's the FOF name. Dublin Core is one ontology. FOF is friend of a friend. FOF. It's more fun to say foof. But friend of a friend, that's another ontology to begin describing relationships between people. So you can see there are all these ontologies out there saying that, all right, here's Scott Davis, and here's the publisher, and here was the Dublin Core issued date. So we can begin seeing exactly when that book was published. Yeah? Excellent. Excellent. So that is RDFA. And there are lots of good resources out there for you. There are lots of ways to incorporate RDFA. But you know how it is with a standards committee. If you're waiting for the committee to come up with the perfect solution, meanwhile, you've got a website you're trying to write right now. Yeah? So there's been this whole grassroots movement, the microformats movement, where people are saying, we're not going to wait for additional attributes. We're not going to wait for the W3C to tell us to do these kinds of things. We're going to turn around and begin reusing these existing attributes in new and exciting ways. It's no less legitimate than having it come from the W3C. As we've found, browser manufacturers add new features to a browser, and only after the fact does W3C come in and codify it and standardize it. 
So many of the micro formats of today will end up being standards as they go, go down. But these grassroots movements are ways that you can provide additional metadata to your websites as well without waiting for the W3C to officially sanction it. If you go to microformats.org, microformats.org, there's a lot of information out there on how you can begin doing this. And notice what the, de the, the description is up here. It's designed for humans first and machines second. They're a set of simple open data formats built on existing and widely accepted standards. So we have specifications like H calendar. If you spend any time in I calendar or VCAL, things like that, what we find is H calendar. These microformats tend to have an H prefix trying to say, hey, guess what? This is being implemented in HTML with the attributes. If you're familiar with a V card, there's an H card that allows you to represent that V card information, not in the XML that you normally would, but you'd represent it in HTML. So there are lots to do with RELs. You can provide licensing for your website. You can provide XFN. That's the XML Friends Network. There are lots of things going on in there. You'll find that there are microformats for almost anything. The geoformat is a very simple way for you to provide lat long information. And that significantly influenced the geocoding API that's now a part of the HTML5 spec. It's a great example of a microformat. People who are already doing it out in the wild and the W3C says, W3C says, we're going to begin paving over the cow paths. We're going to find the paths people have already been wandering and standardize it. And the Geo API is exactly that. But I love some of these examples. The um, H recipe formats, you can begin codifying your recipes. The H resume, it would be interesting if Monster and uh, uh, those different websites began taking advantage of these kinds of things. A very good book out, a very good book out called Microformats Made Simple. I'm actually very excited. I run the HTML5 user group in Denver, and we're going to have the author of this book, Emily P. Lewis, out to visit us next month. If you're ever in the Denver area, please feel free to swing by. We'd love to have you. We offer free pizza, yeah? Okay, okay. But just like with the HTML5 book, this is a very good book, and I encourage you to go out and buy it. But Emily has a great blog. A blognotlimited.com. A list apart was what we talked about earlier. A blognotlimited right here. And she has at least a dozen articles, if not more, walking you through all these various micro formats. So we're going to start with the very simple, but she goes in to H calendar and H card and H resume and a lot of these things in great depth. But let me leave you with some simple examples. Remember the idea behind micro formats? is to reuse existing attributes. So if you have ever used a CSS file in your life, you've used the rel tag, have, excuse me, the rel attribute. When you say link rel equals style sheet, well, we've got a link, and then, well, what is that? How is that related to this link? Oh, well, this is the style sheet. That's metadata that the browser has been using since the very beginning. Well, that's all fine and good. But what if we began using that rel tag for our own nefarious purposes? No, 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 to at least provide more information. Everywhere on Emily's website, when she provides a link back to herself, a blog lot limited, she creates an anchor href like she normally would, but she also provides a rel tag home. And it's a very simple way for people to say, this is my home page. Now, notice she provides a link up in her head section, just like link rel equals style sheet, right below that, we say link rel equals home. That doesn't display. That's pure metadata. But in the middle of your data, when you're creating your anchor hrefs, she provides that rel home as well. It doesn't do anything to the performance of the browser. It doesn't change the way. It's completely hidden. You'd click on that link and away you go. But that additional metadata is also identifying that as her home page. Now, where it gets especially interesting is you can stack up RELs just like you can stack up CSS classes. Space delimited list of these RELs. So she says that, hey, guess what? This is not only my homepage. This is me as well. I'm Emily P. Lewis. 
And so we begin finding search engines like Google and Yahoo begin finding, well, when references of Emily Lewis come up, this is probably related to what we're doing, and it's a way to get more information there. Notice she does that for her Twitter handle as well. If you go to http twitter.com slash Emily Lewis, humans would say, hmm, I wonder if that Twitter handle Emily Lewis is related to the person Emily Lewis. We're able to make that cognitive leap very, very easily. Yeah? But by putting rel me in the middle of that, we're now providing a hint to the computer saying, no, really, this is me. So now we begin learning a lot, don't we? We know there's a person out there called Emily Lewis. We know that she runs a blog called A Blog Not Limited. We know she has a Twitter handle over here, Emily Lewis. And we begin aggregating that information. And once you begin providing that information, it's amazing the kinds of uh, 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 new discoveries can begin blossoming out of that. So this is my Twitter handle, Scott Davis 99 If we go in and take a look at that, it says, all right, yes, I'm from Broomfield, Colorado, and here's my web page, and here's my bio, and things like that. But if we do a view source, ah, oh, the beautiful view source, we begin seeing that Twitter is providing metadata as well. Some of the things like FN and Adder in their full name and address. That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? But we've been talking about this rel all this time. And this is kind of interesting. Rel me is a link back to Thirsty Head. So now Twitter is providing a link back to Thirsty Head. Thirsty Head, if I'm providing a link back to my Twitter account, that's how Google does search engine optimization, doesn't it? It's incoming and outgoing links, and the more incoming and outgoing links that it can verify that are legitimate, it strengthens those relationships, and all of those resources begin floating up to the top. What's especially interesting is when you go in and start looking at the people I follow. Twitter marks that up as well. Twitter goes in and says, guess what? Closely was a company I was working for for a while. David Geary is a good friend of mine. He and I are the co-founders of the HTML5 Denver user group. So when I see David Geary up here, that's his ugly mug up there. But when I see the image over here and I see the relative is a contact of mine, this is now a way that we can begin saying, oh, now Scott knows David Geary. David Geary knows Scott. If someone else knows David Geary, I wonder if this third person, I wonder if Venkat Subramaniam knows Scott as well. I know Venkat knows Dave. I know Dave knows Scott. Does Facebook do this to you all the time? If you've just friended this person, we think you might want these other people to be your friends as well. Yes, this is all metadata. This is all metadata that's enabling the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Googles and the Yahoo's of the world to work. Now, so many times the inner workings are kind of hidden. Facebook has hidden it and Google keeps its page rank algorithm very, very close. But what's exciting is they've offered a public API where you can begin experimenting with this. I encourage you to go to Google and look for the Social Graph API. The Social Graph API is something just like they have GData interfaces for the Google Calendar yeah, and Google Docs and Google Mail and all those other things. They have a social graph API. And if you go in, there are actually examples that you can run right there, forms, HTML forms, where you can go in and fill in the information and see what the results are. Now, of course, typically you won't run it from the web page. You'll incorporate those APIs into your own application. But it is so cool being able to go in and fill in your particular URL. You see, I typed in twitter.com slash... Scott Davis 99 and I click on find connections and it goes out and it says hey these are all the people that connect to you and you know how hard it is sometimes in Twitter to see if someone follows you and you follow them kind of a reciprocal link here it is in one glance what Google has been able to do through the API has been able to find people this is my mother Barbie Davis thank goodness she follows me it would break my heart if she didn't I follow my mother, she follows me, right? But I've found other people who don't follow me, unidirectional, bidirectional relationships. All of this kind of stuff is available to us from metadata. And if I had a live connection here, I'd demo to you that not only is it through my Twitter account, if I go and just type in my 
URL, thirstyhead.com. I can begin finding websites that link to me and link websites that I link to. It's a glimpse, not the full algorithm, but a glimpse of what the page rank algorithm is doing. And it's exposed to you as an API that you can begin taking advantage of. So, what we've talked about here is every bit the web services that you're probably already doing right now. I work with web services all the time. Most recently, I was working on a project with Time Warner Cable where we could have a television up in the master bedroom and the DVR down in the family room. And the DVR, the digital video recorder, the TiVo machine, is providing JSON information for live TV, JSON information for DVR content, JSON information, an API to schedule recordings and delete recordings. And we were doing that in the browser on the TV. Any of your smart TVs, whether it's from Samsung or LG or Sony. Those internet-enabled TVs tend to have browsers. Imagine what it's like having your TV communicate with your DVR through this information. But that example I just gave you was only one step. I'm not saying that microformats should replace your existing web services, be they RESTful or JSON or even Perish the Thought Soap. Yes? But this is meant to augment that information. Rather than making a separate call that is pure data, if you can begin integrating the web with services as we demonstrated with you right here today, it's every bit the bit of web services, but it's one that's going to yield fruit in very interesting and exciting ways. These guys think it's pretty interesting. I think it's interesting as well. Have you enjoyed yourself? Thank you once again for your time. <laughs>